time. My association with Vice President Johnson, LBJ, uh, began in 1961 in December. The United States Air Force had assigned me to the uh, Special Air Missions Unit there in Washington, D.C. after having been about 15 years uh, flying in the Air Force, good deal of experience flying transport airplanes, and any time you went to the Special, special Air Missions Unit up there, you were supposed to have an accident-free record, have a reasonable good character, and uh, so Apparently I had that and they sent me up there and uh, one of the first things that uh, you were taught when you got there was the rules and regulations that you were supposed to be uh, doing in that unit because in the, in the regular Air Force uh, you always flew in dirty airplanes and flying suits and that sort of thing. Once you got there you were supposed to be in a complete full dress uniform, you know, and always clean. The planes were shiny. They were VIP type airplanes. So they always assigned you a uh, indoctrinator, a sponsor, so to speak. And my sponsor, one of the things that uh, he told me right off was say, if you ever get a trip with uh, LBJ, you better be awfully careful. You know, he has quite a reputation for being a very demanding man and he can he can uh, give you lots of trouble if you don't do things exactly as he likes uh, it to be done. Well, that was in, uh, actually that was in 1958 when I first went there, when I was indoctrinated. Well, he was at that time the majority leader of the United States Senate <clears throat> and really didn't travel with the Special Air Missions Unit very often uh, in that particular role. Now, a little bit later when he became the vice president, of course he began to travel a great deal more uh, in the Special Air Missions Unit because the president always had him doing various uh, tasks around the country and consequently <coughs> uh, he traveled a good deal. Well, in 1961, the United States Air Force changed us from uh, flying two-engine Convair type aircraft, prop-driven, uh, prop type airplanes, and they bought 16 Lockheed Jet Stars, and that's this little airplane right here. Uh, they were delivered a couple of months beginning in uh, October of 1961, and the leadership in the Air Force said that, okay, we're going to spend six months just doing nothing but training, shaking the bugs out of those little airplanes uh, before we actually use them in VIP service. However, along about early December, when the vice president heard that they were available over there, even though the six months hadn't expired yet, we began to hear rumbles that he wanted to use one of those airplanes. As it turned out, a mission came in on the fourth day of December, 1961, uh, for him to be picked up at National Airport, flown to Chicago, and then flown to his ranch at Stonewall, Texas, on one of these jet stars. And so guess who got the trip? James U. Cross ended up uh, taking the trip. And of course, at that point in time, I'd never seen the man, didn't know him, didn't know anything about him. All I knew about him was his reputation. I went with some misgivings, of course, because of what I had learned from my sponsor back, uh, oh, September, I guess, of 1958. Anyway, the mission went okay with the exception of the fact that once we uh, got airborne, the weather was bad and the vice president in those years did not get uh, the kind of priority that the president always got as far as air, tra or air traffic control was concerned. We got over Chicago and we had to hold for about 20 minutes. Consequently, he sent word up front to the cockpit that what's the hold up? What the hell's going on up there? So I sent word back that we were holding on account of the weather and we finally were permitted to go on into Chicago, and when he got off the airplane, I was a major at the time in the United States Air Force. He said, Major, I don't like to be late. I said, now let's don't let this happen again. And all I could say was, yes, sir. <laughs> well, when we uh, departed from Chicago about two hours later, he had a speech over there. We departed from Chicago and went on into his ranch, and again, the weather was terrible. It was turbulent. <clears throat> 
And I thought, oh boy, Cross, you're in for some real trouble here, and you may even end up uh, having to leave the Air Force as a result of this because I'd, I was worried about him, you know, with his reputation. Well, we got on the ground at uh, his ranch at LBJ, and he said, uh, well, he got off and he stretched like this, you know, and stood on the top steps of this little airplane. He said, Major, that was a nice trip. I thought, oh boy. Anyway, he said, I want you to come back and pick me up Sunday. I've forgotten exactly what day this was, but he said, I want you to come back and pick me up Sunday. And of course, the uh, pilots in that unit up there never had any say-so about what trips they flew or anything like that. The only uh, airplane that ever had its own pilot was the President's airplane, uh, normally called Air Force One. It's only called Air Force One, by the way, when the President is aboard. But anyway, I told him, well, yes, sir, we'll certainly be glad to uh, send word that you want to be picked up on Sunday, and I'll pass that along when I get back to Washington. Well, the trip to pick him up on the following Sunday, some other pilot took it, which was fine with me because I uh, thought at that point in time I'd had enough uh, uh, of this worry that I was uh, concerned with at that point. Anyway, <coughs> The next time I saw him was early in January 1962, and lo and behold, when I got there, he said to me, he said, well, where were you uh, last, uh, about 14th or whatever day it was in December, said, I, I didn't see you. I said, well, no, so they had me on some other mission, and uh, I, I wasn't able to make it. I'm sorry, sir. Anyway, the, the particular trip that I picked him up for on that January, I believe that was January the 2nd of 1962, the mission came in and we always got a little card, a little 3 by 5 card that told about uh, who the passenger was, uh, what the phone numbers were, uh, what you were supposed to do, generally speaking, but you had to call uh, him, or in his case, uh, one of his assistants, it turned out to be him, and <coughs> the mission was to go from Andrews Air Force Base, uh, pick him up in Texas and take him to Palm Beach, Florida. There he was to meet with the president, who the president, of course, was having his cabinet uh, members there, as well as the leadership in the Congress, and they were going to plot their strategy for the opening of the uh, Congress, which would be, I think, the 8th or 9th of January of, of that year. Well, when I arrived there on the morning of uh, pointed morning, I believe it was the 4th of January, uh, I landed at Bergstrom Field, and I picked up the phone and called the number. It was an Austin number, but it rang at the ranch, and it was him. He answered his own phone. I said, sir, this is Major Cross. I'm here to take you to Palm Beach today, per the uh, instruction that I have from Air Force Headquarters. He said, well, uh, I didn't hear you come in. He said, uh, where are you? I said, well, sir, I'm at Bergstrom Field. He said, well, hell, I don't want to leave from Bergstrom Field. I want to leave from my ranch out here. And I said, well, that kind of flabbergasted me for a moment. And I said, well, sir, uh, we don't have any jet fuel out there, and we have to refuel the aircraft. He said, well, send one of those trucks out from Bergstrom Field and come on out here and just refuel your jet out here, and we can go. And I said, well, sir, there's one other problem. I said, uh, the Jetstar requires about 6,000 feet of runway to get airborne if we have enough fuel on board to uh, go all the way nonstop to Palm Beach. He said, uh, well, hell, Major. He said, I don't know why it is that you Air Force people can always find some way to mess up my plans. I said, well, sir, we could come out there and do just that, but we might have to stop uh, halfway to Palm Beach before uh, and pick up some more fuel before we could make it all the way. He said, well, no, said, uh, what time do I have to leave Bergstrom then to be at Palm Beach at five minutes to four o'clock? And I had already calculated flight plans, two hours and 25 minutes, and of course we'd lose an hour going from uh, Bergstrom Field to the east coast, uh, the eastern time zone. I said, well, sir, we need to leave at 12.30, Bergstrom time. He said, all right, I'll be there. Well, 12.30 came and went, and uh, 
no vice president. 1245 came and went and no vice president. And about that time, one of the uh, officers at the terminal there at Berksham came running out and said, the vice president is on his uh, uh, radio patched into, the, on his car radio, patched into the telephone network. <clears throat> he wants to talk to you. <clears throat> so I hustled into the terminal there and got on the phone. And of course, you had to use, uh, yes, sir, this is Major Cross, over. He said, Major, this is Lyndon Johnson. He said, uh, what time do I have to leave Bergstrom Field to be at Palm Beach at about five minutes to four? <laughs> and of course, I said, well, Mr. Vice President, uh, we really should have left, sir, at 1230. He said, oh, Major, you've got me in a hell of a dither. said, uh, I have to be there at five minutes to four because the plane from Washington is coming in at four o'clock. The President's going to be out there to meet it, and I want to be on the ground there before the president drives up in his own car and also before the plane arrives from Washington. <clears throat> I said, well, sir, where are you right now? I was just trying to buy some time. And he said, well, I'm in Oak Hill right now, which is west of Austin there, about uh, 10 or 15 miles. <clears throat> he said, I'm driving 90 miles an hour on Highway 290. And I thought to myself, oh boy, that's going to be another 20 minutes before he gets here. So we concluded our conversation, hung up, and I walked dejectedly back out to the aircraft. And about that time, up come this Lincoln convertible roaring up. Top was up, of course, because cold weather. And he was alone in it, didn't have a Secret Service or anybody uh, with him. And he said, uh, let's go. He jumped out of the car, and I think Earl Deeth, one of his associates at the radio station, TV station he had in Austin <clears throat> was out there and Earl was going to grab the car and get it out of the way and we ran to the plane. In the meantime, I had Captain Thornhill, who was my co-pilot, start the two right side engines on this little jet. And by the time I got in the uh, airplane and buckled my seat belt, the engineer closed the door and so forth, uh, we had clearance to taxi and the tower told us that the wind was out of the north at 35 miles an hour, so consequently we had to take off to the north. Well, the terminal was at the north end of the runway, and it was nearly three miles down a long taxiway, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, down a long taxiway that was parallel to the runway. Well, we roared south on the, on the taxiway, and I pushed the throttles all the way to the tops, thinking, try to save some time. And the tower called and said, Air Force Two, you're not taking off on that taxiway, are you? Well, we were doing 110 knots taxiing south on the <laughs> taxiway. We said, no, we're not. We're just in a hurry to get to where we can take off. Well, we turned uh, back north on the runway, of course, and they cleared us for immediate takeoff. And I told Colonel, uh, or he later became a colonel, I told Captain Thornhill, I said, uh, let's call Houston Center, which was the air traffic control uh, facility for the area, and I said, tell them that instead of the flight plan that we'd filed, which was to go directly to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, direct to uh, Pensacola, Florida, direct to Orlando, direct to uh, Palm Beach, let's change that, go direct Houston, direct Tampa, Florida, over the Gulf, and uh, direct to Palm Beach. Maybe we can pick up some time. Now, we weren't supposed to fly across the Gulf because we didn't have uh, overwater equipment. The Air Force said that's a no-no, but I thought, well, I'm a dead duck anyway, so go ahead and change the flight plan, which we did. And we kicked, we kicked the airplane to full throttle, and we left it at full throttle all the way, and we flew right on the red line speed, which was about 60 knots, faster than the uh, uh, regular cruise speed of the aircraft, and we pulled in there exactly five minutes to four. But he got off the plane, and he said, I told you you could make it, didn't I? So... That was the really the second encounter, and the uh, encounter, I suppose, that uh, he decided that, well, maybe Cross is a can-do man, and later that night, I learned this the following day, later that night, he apparently spoke to Secretary McNamara, Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, and he told McNamara, said, that fellow that's flying my airplane said, I want you to appoint him, assign him to me permanently. Well, the following afternoon, we were to remain overnight. The following afternoon, uh, he came back about 3 o'clock. We were to go back to the ranch. <clears throat> we could land at the ranch, all right, but we couldn't take off with a full load of fuel. We'd go back to the ranch and drop him off. 
Anyway, he uh, drove up in his limousine in the back seat, and Air Force One, the president's aircraft, was parked 50 yards or so ahead of us. And he headed for it because there's always a White House telephone at the nose of that aircraft, and apparently he wanted to use the phone. But as he drove by our craft here, uh, he stuck his head out the window and waved for me to come on. I was standing by the nose of the aircraft. So I walked up, trotted over. The time I got over there, he was on the phone talking to somebody, and I stood back an appropriate uh, distance, you know. And uh, when he got off the phone, McNamara drove up about that time, and the president walked over, and him and Mac, he and McNamara were talking, and he said, by the way, Bob, this is the Air Force man I told you about last night. Well, McNamara mumbled something, you know, and shook hands with me, and the first time I'd ever met him. Uh, as well. <clears throat> and then he went and got on the White House telephone to talk to someone in Washington, I suppose. And then the president came, or the vice president, I should say, came up to me and he took me by the lapels of my coat. And of course, he stood three or four inches taller than me. Got right down in my face, as he often did with a lot of folks that uh, he dealt with when he wanted to get really personal. And he said to me, he said, Major, I don't know whether you're going to appreciate this or not, but said, I told Secretary McNamara last night that I wanted you to be my regular pilot all the time, and I want this airplane to be uh, redone to my specifications, and I want you to take care of it. I was completely shocked. You know, had no idea that uh, something like this was about to happen, but that is the beginning of my association with uh, Lyndon Johnson right there. And then, of course, over the next uh, two or three years, <clears throat> We had all kinds of adventures. Uh, one in particular I think uh, might be of interest to folks if they ever choose to look at this uh, video in 50 years from now. Uh, a mission came in, and of course I was called directly in this case because I'd already been uh, appointed to be his regular pilot. A mission came in uh, to go from Washington to Grand Turk Island to pick up astronaut Colonel John Glenn, who had just splashed back down into the South Atlantic. And of course, I think it's a fairly well-known fact that President Kennedy had appointed uh, Vice President Johnson as the <coughs> chairman of the Space Council. And apparently in the discussions about Glenn's coming back from his uh, world-famous orbital, three orbital flight around the Earth, uh, Johnson wanted to be sure and go down and, and make that pickup and bring Glenn back to Cape Canaveral where Kennedy would be at Cape Canaveral and there would be a grand, grand welcome for Glenn. And uh, So I was instructed to start making plans for the mission and find out what, how long it would take to get there and what time we should leave to be there at 7 o'clock on the morning, I believe, of February the 23rd, 1962. So I uh, did, and I phoned that back to Colonel Howard Burris, who was the uh, Air Force aide at that time to Vice President Johnson. And uh, then Vice President Johnson himself called me, and we went over all the details, how the weather was going to be. This was a day or so before the actual mission, and the weather was forecast to be good, and it was going to take almost four hours to uh, make the trip down there <coughs> uh, nonstop. And this little jet star here. Anyway, just oh four hours or so before uh, the mission was to go, I had been in my office at Andrews and I had checked the weather and made all the last minute checks. And I went home <clears throat> to enjoy dinner with my family. We were going to have to leave around three or four o'clock in the morning in order to make a 7 a.m. arrival at Grand Turk Island, which is in the Caribbean down there, <clears throat> to pick him up and bring him back to uh, 8 o'clock departure and get him back to Cape Canaveral about 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, I checked the weather and it was supposed to be all right, and I got home and I had my dinner and I was sitting around with my family and thinking about going to bed about 9 o'clock in the evening uh, for a wake up around 3 round two, I guess, and uh, the co-pilot 
at that time was a, a Major Lynn Teen, who was the operations uh, officer of the squadron at that time, called me and he says, uh, say Jim, have you checked the weather lately? And I said, well, yes sir, I checked it just before I left. And I said, it's supposed to be clear all the way. He said, well, look out the window. Well, I run to the window and looked out and literally I could not see across the backyard. He said, you'd better uh, call the vice president or his aide or somebody and just tell them that the weather's zero, zero at Andrews and all over the East Coast and you're not going to be able to make that trip. <clears throat> I said, uh, well, I guess I will. So I called and uh, his telephone, by the way, was listed in the Washington phone directory. The vice president he lived at the Elms. Uh, that was the name of his residence. <clears throat> And uh, so I called, got, looked up his phone number at home, called him, and I told him that the weather had really gone sour, and he said, oh, Lord, Major, we're going to have to go. We're going to have to go. He said, How's the, what's the forecast? I said, well, sir, it's forecast to be this way all night and extends all the way to Atlanta, Georgia. It's zero, zero and fog and low clouds. He said, well, LeMay, General LeMay, who was Chief of Staff of the Air Force at that time, has always told me that the Air Force can fly in any kind of weather, any time, anywhere in the world. And he said, now, by gosh, I want to be sure that we make this trip. The President wants me to make it. We have to do it. It's a world event. And he said, you call General LeMay, and you just tell him that we have to make this. And I'm a major in the Air Force, and the major does not call the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, a four-star general. So what I did, I called my commanding officer, who was a Colonel Tim Ireland out at Andrews, and I told him that I'd been instructed by the Vice President to call uh, General LeMay and get permission to, to make this takeoff. And Colonel Ireland says, hell no, you can't do that. You can't do that. So I called Colonel Burris then, who was the aide to the Vice President, and I told Burris, he said, well, you better call General LeMay. <laughs> So I gutted it up and I called General LeMay, uh, I called through the uh, Air Force Command Post in the Pentagon, asked them to patch me through to the General, told him who I was and why I was calling. They patched me right through to his home. He asked a few questions and said, uh, can you do it? I said, well, yes, sir. We practice this sort of thing all the time under the hood and in the flight simulator. And I said, in, in some conditions of wartime, World War II, I actually made zero, zero takeoffs uh, and much lesser airplanes than the one we'll be flying tonight. He said, well, said, uh, uh, go, go do it. I said, well, sir, my commander out at Andrews says that we cannot do it. He said, don't you worry about that. I'll call and get that straightened out. So anyway, uh, apparently the uh, Air Force Command Post or the general called Colonel Ireland and said, hey, we're going. And uh, then I called back to talk to the vice president, and I told him that uh, we'd been approved for a go. He said, well, do you think we ought to get off right away? By this time, it was almost midnight on that, on the, that would have been the 22nd. And I said, well, sir, it doesn't make any difference. It looks like it's going to be this way all night, so we might as well just uh, uh, go whenever you're ready. I said, it'll probably take you an hour, hour and a half to get here from your residence uh, to Andrews. He said, well, said, well, I'll get ready and we'll come on out there, so you go get ready. And I went on out to the base and got the airplane ready. And Colonel Ireland, in the meantime, was pretty sore about the deal, but he uh, finally decided that it had to, had to happen. And he ended up getting one of the follow me vehicles with a big light on the back that says follow me. And he led us to the runway when we finally uh, got cranked up and got the vice president board. <clears throat> and we uh, lined up on the runway, couldn't see anything but just a couple of the runway lights. But we had very good instruments and very good uh, gyro compasses. We got that all set, got our clearance for takeoff and launched into the darkness that evening. And we topped out on top of that thing in less than a minute at about 3,000 feet. We flew all the way down to uh, uh, Grand Turk. We t took off a little bit early, by the way. We flew all the way down to Grand Turk. Uh, him was asleep all the way. As soon as he got on board the airplane, he took off his clothes, got into his pajamas, and laid down on the couch and went sound asleep. But once we got there, 
we had uh, had had some problems getting fuel down there because it was such a small airstrip. We had sent in a KC-97, which was a, a Air Force tanker type plane that did air refuelings of the bombers and the fighters and so forth. Well, that was the only way we'd get fuel in there. And what we did, we ended up uh, asking them to put a long hose so that when they dropped their boom uh, to start flowing fuel, we clamped a hose onto their boom and then put a nozzle so that we could put it in the tank of the, of the Jetstar there. Anyway, when we got airborne, coming back to Cape Canaveral, of course, John Glenn was in a festive mood and Chris Kraft was aboard and I believe James Webb, who was the uh, uh, director of NASA at that time, and of course the vice president. And we uh, headed back to uh, Cape Canaveral and John Glenn came up in the cockpit, and of course we were quite anxious to visit with him and talk with him, and of course him being a pilot and us being pilots a, a number of years. All we wanted to do was find out what, uh, what uh, sort of uh, uh, thrill it was to be in space and the weightlessness and so forth, and he said, boy, I'm a mainliner when it comes to weightlessness. And then just as he got ready to go back to the cockpit, he chuckled and he said, uh, Say, by the way, I want you to know that I've had the most wonderful experience on your airplane. I said, how's that, uh, Colonel Glenn? He said, well, four or five days before the uh, launch, he said, we were puckered up pretty good. And uh, I said, uh, once we got on board your airplane after coming back, I said, uh, in the restroom back there, I left you a little souvenir. <laughs> We made it back into uh, Cape Canaveral about 10 o'clock, I believe, and the president, of course, met John Glenn, and our mission at that point <coughs> was over. We will take just a little bit of break. Okay. <coughs> sure. June for the retirement of uh, the guy that was flying Air Force One and they installed a new guy whose his name is Mark Tillman. I went for that. I also went for a, uh, a preview of a film that they had made about Air Force One. Okay. Our association continued uh, all through 1962 and 1963 with the Vice President. We traveled actually over those uh, roughly two years, and then on into the presidency uh, for about three years. Uh, we traveled in this little airplane right here, 132,000 nautical miles with him aboard. And uh, I, he really liked that little airplane, by the way. One particular uh, time that he was still the vice president, and we were still trying to get our sea legs, so to speak, uh, with him as uh, uh, we didn't really know him all that well. And we were from time to time uh, wondering if we would survive because we'd get ourselves uh, uh, chewed out uh, uh, pretty regularly. But one time we had uh, landed at his LBJ ranch uh, and we had a bunch of people on board the plane with him. Uh, Sarah McClendon, who was the Gadfly reporter from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, I believe, was one. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, uh, uh, A.W. Morrison, Judge A.W. Morrison and his wife had come in with us, and I believe we'd come from Washington. Anyway, he uh, said to me, he said, Cross said, why don't you and your co-pilot, Captain Thornhill, come on and ride with us out to the Haywood place, which was one of his ranches on Lake LBJ, I believe they called it Granite Shoals at the time, but it was later named Lake LBJ, and said, we'll have some barbecue and dinner out there. Well, that really thrilled us, you know, because here we were dining with the Vice President of the United States, and uh, we were just small fry in the United States Air Force. Anyway, we got out there, and we went in a caravan. Rufus Youngblood was the Secret Service man for the Vice President at that time. Jesse Kellum, who was his... Uh, station manager at KLBJ uh, TV and radio station here in Austin. Uh, 
and uh, Sarah, uh, Yolanda Boozer, one of his secretaries was along. I think Marie Famer, another secretary, was along that evening. And when we got there, uh, we were going down this long gravel road into the ranch itself off of U.S. Highway 71, which led up to uh, Lano, Texas. We took the couple of mile of gravel road that went into the ranch down to the lakefront. On the way in, there was a great big rattlesnake across the road in front of us, and Vice President stopped the car and yelled at Rufus Youngblood, come up here, Rufus, and shoot this snake. Well, the snake had crawled over into a pile of uh, prickly pear right beside the road. And I remember vividly, Rufus uh, took two or three shots at the snake, and the pres or Vice President said, uh, Rufus, can't you hit that? Let me shoot that snake. Rufus finally shot the snake. And we started to leave, and the vice president said, no, uh, pick him up, put him on the hood of this car. So Rufus or one of the other folks there picked up the rattlesnake and put him up on the hood of the car, and we drove on down to the uh, uh, ranch. And I don't believe Sarah was along at that point, but she came later. Anyway, the president uh, had told Rufus, now, you take that snake and save it, because I'm going to play a trick on uh Sarah McClendon. So he did. He put it off out there beside of a trail that went from the house down to the uh, uh, waterfront where the boat dock was. And then the vice president and some of his guests, not we Air Force folk, we stayed at the house. But the, some of the guests went down and got on the speedboat. And they rode around on the lake till just about dark, almost not quite, but just about dark. And when they <coughs> came back, uh, Rufus was to have left that snake right beside the uh, trail and the vice president was walking along there with Sarah and he got real close, he knew where it was, and he got real close and he said, Sarah, look at that snake, it's going to bite you. And Sarah just had a conniption fit about that point and the vice president had a great laugh out of it and Sarah uh, couldn't get over it for the rest of the evening but she kept talking about it. Anyway, we went over back up, or they came back and joined the rest of us already out on a patio there. I believe this was in September, so it was warm that evening, and we were sitting on the patio, and they brought out the barbecue and the plates and so forth, and we were all sitting around <clears throat> uh, enjoying a good meal and enjoying the, the company. He was in a rare, festive mood that night, uh, kidding everybody. And finally he got around. I had talked to him a day or two before that, about uh, his cattle that had been left to roam on that runway out there at the ranch uh, when there was nothing coming in. They would, they would run them off the runway when we were due to come in or any other planes were due to come in. Otherwise, the cattle roamed on the runway and ate the grass along the sides of the runway. And when they uh, had to do their thing, of course, they didn't care where they were. It might be on the middle of the runway or, or whatnot. And uh, so they would let fly with uh, scat uh, right in the runway. And that acid, I suppose it's acid, that uh, forms in those piles was eating holes in the runway. And I had told him about this and that they, they should leave those cattle off the runway or patch the holes or something because we might come in in this very hard, uh, uh, tired little airplane and crunch through the runway and, and have some sort of an accident. Well, he took that particular occasion that night to tell Jesse Kellum, <coughs> he said, Jesse, <coughs> excuse me, he said, Jesse, the major tells me that your cows are crapping on his runway out there and tearing it up. Now, by God, you just get those cows off of his runway. And so I thought that was rather amusing that he would... Uh, uh, take that kind of a approach to getting those cows off of my runway. Obviously it wasn't my runway. <laughs> uh, after dinner, we all loaded up in the cars and got ready to go back and the president, was, or the vice president, I keep saying the president because I remember him more lately as a president. Anyway, the vice president was driving his own car, Lincoln Convertible, and uh, 
Judge A.W. Morrison, a local judge in Johnson City out there and a very good friend of the president's, uh, was in the front seat with him and Paul Thornhill, Captain Thornhill, and I were in the back seat. And we were the lead vehicle in the convoy of half a dozen vehicles of sorts. And so once the four of us got into the car, well, he just took right off and the others were still loading up. We went over a little rise and uh, he got on his radio. He always had radios in all of his cars. Got on his radio and he says, uh, Rufus, you hold up everybody back there now just for a minute or so, said, uh, me and the judge are going to stop here just over the hill and we're going to check out the plumbing here. <laughs> so I thought that was rather amusing. And again, I'm still learning about uh, the president's uh, personality and uh, his humorous side of him and in fact the very demanding side of him as well. And so that was an early lesson in uh, something LBJ, something about LBJ. <clears throat> It would take another second or two, and let me have a sip of water, please. Okay. Okay. Long about mid-1963, in my association with uh, Vice President Johnson, we were supposed to pick him up <clears throat> in Idlewild Airport in New York. Later, I understand, name, renamed to JFK Airport. And we were to pick him up at 3 a.m. in the morning. <coughs> Got there about 1 o'clock in the morning. And he showed up right on the money at 3 o'clock. We started to, again, we're in this small Jetstar airplane here. And uh, we tried to start the engines, and the number four engine wouldn't start. Had a bad starter. Well, he was hard to get along with, shall I say, and uh, he didn't know why the hell it was that the Air Force could always figure out some way to uh, shortchange his plans, and I assured him that uh, we'd do our best to get another airplane, and which we did. We finally <clears throat> called back to Washington and they sent us another airplane. We left that one up there <clears throat> for them to change the starter on it, <clears throat> and we took off for for Texas, landing at his ranch at about, we finally got off at six o'clock in the morning. We landed at his ranch at about nine, thereabouts, somewhere in that range. And he told us, now you stay here at the uh, LBJ ranch uh, because I want you to go with me tonight. And we didn't know where we were going that night, but anyway, we hung around the airplane there on the ramp at the ranch, and <laughs> we had no sleep, of course. We'd been up all night. And at about 5 o'clock, he came out, got in his car, and he drove by the hangar out, out there at the ranch at Stonewall. And he said, you boys, come on. <clears throat> so we got in the car with he and Ms. Johnson and uh, just the two of us, Paul and Paul Thornhill and I. And we went down to the rodeo grounds at Johnson City. He was, we found out when we got there, to give a talk to the uh, graduating class, or some kind of a class. Uh, it, well, it had to have been a graduating class because I believe it was late May of 1963. And here we are sitting up in the stands, you know, and thinking, boy, this is really great. We're invited by the Vice President of the United States to attend one of his speeches and get a front row seat. Lo and behold, when he got to talking, he was introduced and began his talk. He said, well, he said, you know, uh, I graduated right here in this school some number of years ago, and I've forgotten exactly what he said, uh, from high school, and it's a wonderful thing. And He said, and we were going to make this uh, speech tonight in spite of all hell. said, the Air Force and these two young men sitting here that flew my plane tried their best to keep me away from here tonight, but I insisted and we made it anyway. So <laughs> I felt about this tall, of course, but uh, that was his way. And I think that uh, it's a well-known fact that he would uh, try to do things like that and make his points not only to us, but to show what sort of a, a control he had over 
over various uh, things in his life and over the various people that served him. So that was a, another interesting thing that happened. Sometime later, uh, well, no, I believe it had been a little earlier. Matter of fact, I know it was. It was in November 1962. The jet stars were grounded for some mechanical defects, and, and he had to go to uh, New York uh, to Mrs. Roosevelt's funeral. I, I believe that was in November 1963. And I was no longer current to fly the, uh, the Convair, and uh, so didn't expect, you know, that I'd be invited. But anyway, he called me, and he says, Now, Cross, he said, uh, I've got to go to Mrs. Roosevelt's funeral, but said the president's going to be going to that funeral, and he's going to be landing at some place up there, and I don't want to land my plane uh, anywhere around where the president is because when the funeral's over, I've got to get back to Washington. said, uh, uh, I'm giving a reception for Bob Novak, and the, I forget the lady's name that he was going to marry, Geraldine something or other at my home at the Elms tonight, and I have to get back. Now, I don't want to be delayed by the president, any. I said, now, you work it out with the FAA, and you find an airport that'll be close enough that we can get over to Hyde Park and make the funeral, but then when I come back from the funeral, I want to get on the airplane and absolutely don't want to be delayed at all by the president, uh, who's going to be wanting to come back to Washington as well. So I worked it out. Uh, tried to anyway with the FAA and we landed at Poughkeepsie Airport. I was not the pilot but he wanted me to be along and he had another aide, an army guy named uh, William Bill Jackson, a colonel, an army colonel. And uh, Colonel Jackson was along of course and the usual staff that the president or vice president always carried with him. I think Yolanda Boozer was along and uh, two or three others. We went up on a Convair, and I'm just riding along. I had been qualified to fly the Convair, but it wasn't at this point, so I was just along. Uh, sort of as an uh, aid without portfolio, if you will. Uh, we got there, and the weather was kind of bad, but anyway, they went on. he went on to the funeral for Mrs. Roosevelt and came back about uh, 4 o'clock. And lo and behold, the weather had gone kind of sour, which meant that the FAA uh, folks had a little bit of a problem controlling all the traffic in the area. And we heard over the radio that the, uh, all traffic was being held for the president's departure. And Colonel Jackson was really catching lots of heck back there in the back of the airplane from the vice president. And I guess he stood it about all he could, and he come running up to the front. I was in the front with the pilots, uh, not in the seat, of course, but up there with them. And uh, he come running up and says, you better come back here and talk to the vice president. said, he is madder than a hornet. So I went back and uh, tried to console him a little bit, and he wasn't to be consoled. He said, God damn it. He said, uh, you told me that you had it all worked out. We could land over here at Poughkeepsie, and we could take off. And I said, well, yes, sir. I did, and, and that's the way it was supposed to be. But I said, something has uh, come up that uh, doesn't permit us to get off like we'd hoped to. And he said, get down here. He was sitting in his chair, and he made me squat down right beside his chair in the back, sort of the captain's chair, if you will, in the back stateroom. And uh, he held on to this arm, or this arm, I'm sorry. And here I am squatting, and a, a fellow you know that squats for five minutes or so, his legs get to uh, uh, go to sleep. And that's about what happened to me. My legs began to go to sleep, and I was really in pain. And he was chewing me out, telling me that he didn't know why in the world that I couldn't get things done, and uh, just over and over and over. Well, finally he softened up a little bit, and he said, you know, he said, uh, in the meantime, we're getting ready to go. I could feel us taxiing and getting onto the runway. And I thought, well, he'd turn me loose and I'd be able to go back and sit down and put on my seat belt. But he didn't. He said, you know, he said, I don't know why in the hell I ever took the job as vice president anyway. He said, the vice president, nobody loves him. I don't get any priority. Never do get to do what I want to do. He said, I think when I get out of this term, I'm going to go back to Texas and just retire. He said, Ms. Johnson got plenty of money, and I got plenty of my money, and my 
two girls have got a million dollars apiece. Says, I don't know why the hell nobody likes me anyway, so I'm just going home to Texas. And about that time we took off, and I fell <laughs> from the thrust of the airplane, I fell beside the vice president's chair, and I thought that was an interesting uh, uh, little item in our long relationship of some 11 years, beginning in 1961 and uh, ending when he died in 1973. Uh, <clears throat> Another interesting period of time came after President Kennedy was assassinated. <clears throat> Actually, a couple of days before the assassination, we had been traveling uh, a good bit in this little jet star right here all over the country, and I think we'd been gone about 10 days. <clears throat> and we arrived back at his ranch on the early, early morning Wednesday, which would have been the 20th of uh, November, 1963. He got off the airplane and he said, Cross, you look tired. I said, well, yes, sir. He said, well, why don't you go back over to Bergstrom tonight and spend the night, spend the rest of the night, and said, uh, you might as well go back to Washington tomorrow and be with your family. And uh, I thought that was a nice gesture to him think of my family and after we'd been gone for about 10 days. He said, uh, the president will be coming in Thursday to San Antonio, and he'll be on number 26,000, which is this airplane, the big airplane over here. And he said, he'll also have a backup 707. And he said, what I'll do is I'll take my uh, private plane. He had his own uh, private plane at that time. I believe it was the Queen Air and his own private pilot. He said, I'll take my private plane and fly down to San Antonio uh, meet with the president, and then when we leave from San Antonio to go to Houston, said, I'll take the backup uh, plane that the president has with him and go from San Antonio to Houston, from Houston to Fort Worth, Fort Worth to Dallas, and then I'll come on back home on the backup plane to Washington <clears throat> after all the Dallas function is over. He said, so you spend the night at Bergstrom, get you some rest. When you get up tomorrow, give me a call. Uh, because I might want you to take something back or call somebody or do something for me. And I said, all right, sir. And so we left and went back to Berksham, spent the night, the rest of the night. Got up about noon the following, or that morning, really. And uh, I got ready to go back to Washington and picked up the phone to call him. And I said, Mr. Vice President, sir, you told me last night to call you before we started back to Washington. I'm ready to go. And is there anything you want me to do for you? And he said, no. Matter of fact, there's not a thing. Don't have anybody to go back. And said, I'll see you next uh, Monday. And I said, all right, sir. And I started to say goodbye. And he said, God bless you. And so we did. We hung up. And I went on back to Washington. And then, of course, on uh, the succeeding second day, which would have been the 22nd, uh, the president was tragically assassinated. And... <clears throat> Uh, things changed dramatically at that point, uh, certainly for me, because things had been rather informal uh, in my association with the vice president. The security wasn't uh, nearly as uh, important, or it didn't seem to be. There wasn't a uh, palace guard, so to speak, surrounding him all the time, and uh, all of a sudden he's, he's totally unreachable as far as uh, my own association with him was concerned. And I had no idea what was going to uh, transpire with my life at that point in time with the president, uh, with the new president, that is. <clears throat> Some days uh, later, I'm going to guess it might have been two weeks, he called me, uh, which I was pleased, of course, to hear from him, having been with him for a couple of years at that point. And he said, Cross, I want you to uh, go and learn to fly that big jet that the president uses. And said, uh, I also want to keep my jet star because that's the only thing we can get in and out of that ranch with. And I like the jet star when I don't want anybody uh, along with me other than just the minimum staff and the minimum secret service. And said, we'll use the jet star a lot too. <clears throat> 
He said, I've told uh, uh, Secretary McNamara and the Air Force authorities that I want you to go to school and get qualified in the big jet, which I did. It took about four or five months. And then I started to fly with Colonel Jim Swindle, who had been the pilot for President Kennedy. And I flew with Colonel Swindle about a year and a half, I guess. Uh, we did all of the campaign in 1964. And it was a, a, a difficult task because and it was difficult for him simply because he had so many stops to make and so many hands to shake and so many speeches to give that uh, he was even more hoarse than I am today uh, for all of his speeches. But anyway, we, we traveled uh, all over the country during that period of time. Uh, we did not make any overseas trips that I recall, but in June of 1965, he called me one night at uh, about midnight, and uh, I'm still a major in the Air Force, by the way, and Colonel Swindle was a full colonel. But unfortunately for the colonel and for me as well, uh, the vice president, I'm sorry, I said the vice president, now we're into the presidency. The president, I think, never understood, or if he did, he didn't care. Uh, about rank and that sort of thing in the military. And he would often tell me to uh, tell a general or tell that colonel that I want this and this and so forth done. And so it kind of put me on the spot being a major and having to call generals and colonels and tell them uh, uh, that he didn't like what was happening. As a matter of fact, let me go back just a minute. Uh, right after he became the president, there was a lot of uh, uh, activity going on out at the ranch to put in communication systems that had not been available to him as vice president. Uh, they were uh, making all sorts of uh, safety precautions for his life. Uh, Secret Service was making a lot of changes out there. And I was, of course, out there every time he was at the ranch uh, with this jet star. That's what he wanted me. He had told me that I want you out here all the time. Still a major. So one of uh, his aides, General uh, McHugh, I believe his name was, he was an Air Force Brigadier General, Godfrey T. McHugh, that was his name, uh, flew in there one day when we were at the ranch. He was, and I was, of course, out there. And General McHugh came in on a T-39 Sabreliner, which was a little Air Force two-engine jet sort of a passenger plane. <clears throat> and General McHugh, as I understand it, had never been through pilot training, but some way or another he had got a pilot's rating. And I, I always thought, and everybody that knew the general told me he was minimally qualified as a pilot. Nonetheless, he came in there with an instructor one day at the ranch, and when he taxied in, he taxied off the runway and buried that T-39 in the mud out there. I mean, plumb up to the wings. It was just laying on the wings. Well, the president came out there <laughs> and saw it. He said, what the hell is that? Asked me. And I said, well, Mr. President, that's uh, General McHugh's airplane. He taxied it off in the mud out there. And we're trying to get somebody out from Berkson Field with some airbags and whatnot to float it out of the mud and get it righted so that he can leave. He said, well, you get rid of him. You just fire him. By God, tell that Air Force or somebody that I don't ever want to see him out here again. Well, again, here I was in a position of, uh, of uh, just being a major and having to talk to a general. So I chose not to uh, uh, take him to heart exactly what he said. But I did uh, tell the general that it was going to take at least... 12, 14 hours to get that thing out of the mud, and that there was a jet star that was at the ranch that would be going back to Washington, and he could take the jet star and ride back on it. The following day, we'd get another pilot down to fly the T-39 uh, out once we found it to be airworthy. I say this about uh, what the president said, uh, more or less to point out that he really didn't care about rank. He didn't care who uh, got hurt in a situation like that. 
And uh, I found myself in that position many, many times over the next uh, two, three years in my association with him. Can we take another break so I can get a sip of water, please? Okay. Another interesting uh, thing came about, and I believe I started to talk about this a minute ago, and then I thought of something else. Uh, he called me one night about midnight, and I think it was in June of 1960. And I think he was sort of in his chips. <laughs> you know, they were having a function at the White House, and the function was to entertain Jim McDivitt and Ed White, who had made the orbital flight. I don't remember how many orbits they made, but Ed White had been the first man to walk in space. And the uh, Paris Air Show was taking place right at that time. Soviet Union had sent over a huge, huge jet transport, the largest one in the world at that time, and they were getting all the uh, attention at the Paris Air Show. And the president, I suppose, maybe at the party that night, decided that, hey, the thing to do is let's send our two astronauts over to the Paris Air Show, and maybe we can overshadow the attention that the Russians were getting on on their big uh, transport plane. Anyway, he called me and I could tell they were partying at the White House because there was a lot of noise and it sounded to me like he might have been uh, sort of overly festive, maybe had a couple of drinks. And he said, Cross, I want you to find Hubert Humphrey he said, I don't know where he is. He's traveling somewhere in New York, I think. And, of course, our command post was able to track all of our planes, and Humphrey would have been on one of these jet stars, in fact, was on one of the jet stars. And he said, you get him back here, and said, I'm going to send Jim McDivitt and his wife and Ed White and his wife out there, and I want you to take my airplane and uh, fly to Le Bourget Airport in Paris and attend the air show. So he said, I want you to leave about 1 a.m. Well, first of all, this was about midnight, and uh, he, he oversimplified things a lot of times. And in this case, it took us till I think, maybe 7 o'clock in the morning to locate and get Hubert Humphrey back to Washington with his wife and get them aboard the airplane. In the meantime, we got uh, McDivitt and his wife and uh, Ed White and his wife, and they came on out, and we put them aboard the airplane and actually uh, let them lay down. We had some bunks on the airplane, let them lay down and rest a little bit. And we got off about 7 a.m. in the morning and flew to the Paris Air Show with Humphrey and, uh, and those two astronauts. And it made the news worldwide and really accomplished what the new president wanted to do. Shortly after that, <clears throat> I believe it would have been around the 10th of July in that year. Uh, the word came out that General Chester Clifton, who was the Army aide to President Kennedy and had stayed on for a year and a half there with the Johnson administration, was going to retire. And there was a lot of speculation in the Pentagon as to who was going to be the new uh, aide to the president. And certainly I'm I'm still a major in the Air Force, been a major for four years at that point in time. I had no idea whatsoever that uh, he would even consider me to, to, to take that position. And he never said anything to me about it, never knew a thing about it. And on the 10th of July, it was announced that I was going to be the uh, new Armed Forces aide to replace Major General Chester Clifton. Uh, now, this was a real bombshell. Here I am, a major, and I'm, I'm going to be a lieutenant colonel on the 15th of that month, <clears throat> but I'm a major on the date it was announced, uh, replacing a major general. And so the Pentagon, I think, probably did a slow roll, and everybody in the Air Force uh, was aghast that uh, uh, something like this was going to happen to a Piney Woods uh, boy from South Alabama, uh, not the least of of those uh, doomsayers was me. <laughs> I had no idea that he was going to do it. He never asked me about it. 
I've, I can say that I don't think I even knew how to spell military aid at that point in time. But anyway, the first thing he said to me two or three days later when he uh, finally talked to me about it, he said, now, Cross, he said, uh, you got the damnedest mess over there in that military office that I've ever seen. There's 2,000 people that work over there. And says, I don't know who they are. I don't know what they do other than the fact that every afternoon about 4 o'clock they uh, start drinking martinis and taking off for all the uh, embassy parties around Washington and telling stories about how they work for the president and giving press conferences and that sort of thing. He said, now I don't want you to piss anybody off. I don't want you to fire anybody, but I want you to get rid of half your people as soon as you get over there in your office in the White House uh, in the East Wing. And he said, uh, if you can't do the job, I'm going to give you six months. And if you can't do the job, I'll find somebody that can. <laughs> so that was my charter as the new director of the military office in the White House. Oh, and he, as in a parting shot, he said, by the way, I want you to still fly both my airplanes. So that was my initiation into the White House in July 1965. Over the ensuing years over there, every day was something new. Uh, I, using a metaphor, I suppose, uh, about fighter pilots and how they end up uh, in firefights with opposing aircraft. They talk to one another on the radio. They always have a wingman, and a wingman is supposed to protect the leader. And the wingman, if he sees somebody on the uh, leader's tail, uh, a bogey, he says, uh, you got a bogey on your 6 o'clock. Well, in my case, uh, I will use that metaphor and say that uh, my 6 o'clock got dusted pretty regularly by the uh, vice pre or the president at that point in time because of some uh, particular thing that he didn't like uh, what was happening. And I stood in the way of a lot of those, and I'm sure that most of the president's uh, uh, personal aides at one time or another got their 6 o'clock dusted as well. Uh, can I take another sip of water, please? Yeah. One of the most interesting stories, I think, that uh, I could tell about the president that would typify his personality and Prime Minister Harold Holt of Australia was uh, drowned in a swimming accident right around the middle of December, I believe, in 1967. And prior to the drowning, the president and his family, and of course I, had been at the ranch for the Thanksgiving holidays, and we'd been down there, I think, about maybe 10 days, as I recall. And prior to the time that we came back to Washington, I had uh, visited with the president and told him that this large airplane here, number 26,000, the primary presidential aircraft, was overdue for its biennial inspection by about three months. We'd had so much going on in that period of time that we simply couldn't take it out of service to send it for its overhaul and inspection. Our uh, facility that did the overhaul was in uh, New York at Idlewild or JFK Airport. The Lockheed Air Service Company did the work on all the planes uh, on a contract. And I had told him it was overdue and that uh, if he didn't think that he'd be needing that aircraft uh, over the next couple of months. It really ought to go in for its overhaul. He said, well, yes, and we're, we're going to stick around pretty close to Washington now. We may want to come home for Christmas, but said we can take one of the backup airplanes or take the Jetstar, depending on how many people we're going to have down for Christmas. 
He said, you go ahead and send it. Well, to protect myself, I wrote him a little short memorandum a day or two later, and I said to him, uh, per our conversation, Mr. President, uh, your airplane, your number one airplane, is overdue for going into overhaul, and uh, I would like to confirm with you that it's okay to send it. And I put a little note at the bottom, uh, see me, yes, no, you know, the usual thing that we always did, those of us that was on his staff, uh, to get his approval or disapproval. It came back approved. Came back to my office next day, I guess, approved. So I sent one of my other pilots to take it to New York and promptly forgot about worrying about that. Had plenty of other problems to worry about. And uh, when Prime Minister Holt had his accident and, and perished, perished over there in uh, the swimming accident, uh, the word came through on the teletype, and I had a teletype in my office, so I got the word pretty quick. Uh, he called me, and he said, uh, have you seen the news about the Prime Minister Holt? And I said, yes, sir, I have. He said, well, you need to get my big airplane ready to go. And he said, uh, we'll need to leave probably tomorrow to go to the funeral. And I reminded him at that point that his big airplane, the number one, we had a backup, of course, a 707, but it wasn't near as comfortable. It didn't have the long legs or long range uh, that this big airplane had. It was a 707, but just a shorter version. I reminded him that uh, we had sent the airplane to New York to be overhauled, and uh, he said, well, that's all right. I said, uh, just call him up and tell him you'd be up there to get it this afternoon. I said, well, no, sir, I had been up there four or five days before, and I'd seen the airplane scattered pretty well across the hangar. The interior was pretty well gutted out of it, and some of the control surfaces were off, the landing gears were off, and uh, there's no way in the world it could be uh, flown out. And I told him this, I said, well, it's pretty well dismantled, Mr. President, and we're just going to have to take one of the backup planes. He said, well, no. I said, you just call them up and tell them to put it back together, and you'll be up tomorrow and get it. Well, I finally convinced him that there was no way that we could do that. He grumbled about it and said, well, he he used this term on me a lot of times. He said, I don't know why the hell it is that you Air Force people can always figure out something to screw up my plans. So I just sort of chuckled about that. I'd had it so many times it really didn't uh, bother me anymore. And I knew it was uh, probably in, in the way of good-natured uh, uh, needling me anyway. So uh, he said, well, get one of those backup airplanes fixed out there for me. He said, put one of my good beds on it. And, put some soundproofing in it. Those, those backup jets don't have enough soundproofing in them and said, uh, we're going to be flying a lot and I'm going to be needing to sleep so you better put some covers over the windows so those little sliding windows don't block out the light. Said, you put some covers over the windows so we can sleep on board while we're making the trip. So we we, my maintenance officer out there at <coughs> Andrews, I told him what we needed to do, and they pretty well gutted one of the airplanes, and we started rebuilding the inside of it and put a, a kind of a curtained-off area for the president to have. Any point you wanted to in the story, and this could be edited. Okay. It took about two days to uh, get the final word on when the memorial service, they never did find Prime Minister Holt's body, and it took a couple of days until we learned that the memorial service would be, I believe, on the 22nd of December. In any event, we left Washington on the 19th and had to make several fuel stops. We stopped in California and then we stopped again in uh, Honolulu, stopped at American Samoa and then went on into uh, Canberra. Uh, we were going to be there about 24 hours and just prior to the arrival at Canberra I was rather tired, been up for 30 hours or so. And I got up out of my seat and 
walked back through the cabin and stretched, and the president had just gotten out of bed, asked me what time we're going to be there, and I said, well, we'll be there in about 30 minutes, uh, uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> and we had already started to let down a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, he said, and I hadn't, I hadn't shaved, you know, I needed to shave, and I guess my eyes were red, bloodshot, and he said, well, Cross, you look tired. I said, well, yes, sir, I'm a little tired. He said, well, get you a hotel room, and I uh, said, I won't be needing you for about 24 hours when we get to Canberra. Well, I don't know that he was aware, or if he was, it really didn't concern him, that uh, we always had advance uh, preparations made for not only his arrival at wherever we were going. We had telephones and uh, everything in place, including hotel reservations for everybody, and I always stayed just two or three doors down from the president <clears throat> because of my association with him and uh, being the military aide as well as his pilot because oftentimes he'd want to see me about something. Anyway, he said, well, you get you a room and I won't need you for 24 hours and get you plenty of rest as we've got a real long haul ahead of us yet. So I don't know where we're going to be going back uh, through Alaska or the Philippines or Japan. <clears throat> And I had already talked to him about going to Rome, but he didn't want anybody to know that we might go to Rome. And he kept telling me, now, don't you go out and tell everybody in the world that we might go to Rome. And I said, oh, no, sir. He said, oh, yeah, you'll tell everybody. No, sir, I won't tell anybody. Anyway, I went to my room, which was just a few doors down from his, and uh, I'd taken a bath and shaved and cleaned up and really dead sound asleep and the phone rang. It's a White House phone. I picked it up and uh, I'd been in bed about an hour I guess. And he said, where are you? <laughs> I said, well sir, I'm in my room. I didn't tell him I was sound asleep. He said, well uh, come on over here. I want to talk to you. So I got up. I had on a t-shirt, clean t-shirt put on a pair of trousers and had some slippers and I slipped into my slipper and walked down the hall. And uh, of course the Secret Service all knew me and I went right on in. Got inside and George Christian was in there with him and Walt Rostow, uh, Jack Valenti and Marvin Watson. Marvin was the Chief of Staff and Valenti was a former Special Assistant, now the uh, Motion Picture Director, President of the Motion Picture Association I believe. And he had come along on the trip, by the way. George was in there because he was a press uh, secretary. And Rostow was in there because, of course, he was a national security advisor. And they were talking about possibilities. Could we go to Vietnam? And if we did, could we leave from there? And what time would we get to Rome? He was still wanting to see the Pope. So this went on for, I guess, 30 minutes, back and forth, back and forth. And he... he still didn't say that for sure we were going to, to go to Rome. And when I finally uh, left the room, the conversation seemed to be pretty well over, I left the room. And in my mind, I knew we were going to make Rome. But he said, now, don't you go out of here and start telling everybody we might go to Rome. He said, I don't think we're even going to go to Rome. We're going to go to uh, Thailand and I'm going to talk to some of the troops and then we might go back to Vietnam and I'll talk to the troops again and and then we'll probably go back through Alaska and go home. Yes sir, I won't tell a soul. Well, the press plane, which was uh, always commanded by a good friend, a fellow named Doug Moody, Pan American pilot, uh, wanted to know what our next move was and I said, Doug, I don't know. I said, if, if we get airborne, we're going to let you uh, take off after we do. Uh, the press always liked to take off after Air Force One because the press wanted to be on the ground in case we crashed uh, on takeoff. And of course we always let them pass us so they could land ahead of us wherever we were going. And I said, uh, when we get airborne, you just stay in radio contact with me and when I learn anything, wherever we're going, I'll let you know. In the meantime, just take a course out of, uh, uh, we were leaving from Melbourne really at that point. That's where the service was. said, you take a northwest course because I'm sure we're going to go to, to Thailand and I'll tell you where to land uh, when I find out. So 
We did. We took off and we had to stop in Darwin, Australia for fuel. The, jet, the, the press plane did not. They had enough fuel to go all the way. And we went into uh, Corrad Air Force Base. And in the meantime, I called the uh, press plane and told them that's where to land. And when we got there, <coughs> pandemonium reigned supreme because they were running combat missions out of uh, Karat Air Base with F-105s. And we came in there with a big uh, press plane, a big 707. We had a backup plane and then, of course, the President's plane. And all this commotion in the middle of the night landing in Karat Air Force Base. We uh, spent about four hours there. And when we took off, we were going to take back to the southeast along the Cambodian uh, uh, coastline. We couldn't go across Cambodia because they were uh, communistic and unfriendly to us. And we flew southeastward until we uh, skirted the south tip of Cambodia. Then we turned and went over Saigon. Well, just about the time we were to go over, uh, make our turn, go back a little bit to the northeast, towards Saigon and on to Cameron Bay, where uh, General Westmoreland had a number of uh, <clears throat> troops out there to be reviewed by the president. Anyway, Marvin Watson came into the cockpit and he said to me, he said, uh, have you got the medals? And I said, what medals uh, are you talking about, Marvin? I said, I've got some Purple Hearts. I knew that coming over in this part of the world, we had." Uh, probably go visit a hospital and the president might give some Purple Hearts as he walked through the hospital. He said, no, he said he's going to give uh, uh, distinguished service medals to all of the admirals and the generals that are over here commanding in this war. And I said, well, nobody's told me about it. He said, well, uh, uh, the president said that you knew about it. I said, no, I sure don't. He said, well, you better get some. So. Fortunately, I had two very good friends. One was the chief of staff of General Westmoreland's uh, MACV headquarters, a brigadier general. <clears throat> Bill Knowlton was his name. And I thought, well, I'll call Bill Knowlton. And the other fellow that I had was a good friend over there, had been a squadron mate of mine, as a matter of fact, was Colonel Ernest Triplett. He was the head of the uh, military air transport service base at Tonsonut Airport in Saigon. So I called, I told my radio man, I said, I don't care who wants to use the telephone, the radio telephone, even the president. You just tell him it's not working right at the moment. I said, I want, we had just two lines on board. I want both lines uh, uh, right now to get in touch with Colonel Knowlton, or General Knowlton and Colonel Triplett. So he did, he, he wouldn't let anybody else use the telephones. And uh, I got Colonel Knowlton and I told him what I needed. He said, you got it, Jim. We were good friends. And he said, you got it. What will I do with them when I package them up? I said, you take them to Colonel Ernest Triplett down at the MAC terminal. He said, I know Colonel Triplett. I said, well, take them down there and uh, give them to him. And in the meantime, I'm going to talk to him and get him to commandeer the first airplane that's sitting on the ramp with the engines running. And no matter where it's going, it's, its new destination is Cameron Bay. He said, all right, well, all this worked out just fine. And uh, we got the medals and got them on the plane and redirected it to Cameron Bay. And about that time, we were going over Saigon. And I thought, well, when we get to Cameron Bay, that the president will, of course, want to get out and review the troops. And then he'll be wanting to make a speech. And it'll probably take 30 minutes. So by that time, hopefully the medals will be here. As it turned out, they just barely got to Cameron Bay and a, a little colonel fellow named Giannini ran up. I had designated him to catch the plane and get the medals in the little box that was supposed to be marked with my name. He ran up with the medals and uh, Marvin Watson and I were standing at the foot of the steps at the platform, sort of a homemade platform that had been put up out there for the president to address the press and the troops and whatnot. The president went up made his speech. Marvin and I are frantically, frantically tearing open the boxes. And I, of course, uh, would run up with a medal when the president would read the, or I had another guy reading the citations and uh, help the president pin it on and I run back down and get another medal and we got them all done. 
And I thought, oh boy, that really worked out to, to everybody's satisfaction, hopefully. And then he turned, the president turned to the press and the crowd, and Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, who was the United States ambassador to Vietnam at that time, was sitting on the platform. And he said, and Ambassador Bunker, it's my privilege and honor to present you with the Medal of Freedom. And he looked down at me and Marvin at the foot of the steps. And I had no idea who was in charge at the Medal of Freedom. Turns out, I believe it's Treasury Department handles it. But I had no connection whatsoever with the Medal of Freedom, where to get one or anything, and, and had no idea he was going to give the Medal of Freedom to anybody. So when he turned and looked at me, all I could do was this. And he turned back to the crowd and to the press and to Ambassador Bunker. And he said, well, Mr. Ambassador, said my military aide has failed me one more time. <laughs> so I thought, well, what could I do? Well, the ceremonies were over about that time, and the airplane was sitting over there about 100 yards away, ready to go. And when he came down off the steps, he said, come on. So I fell in like a good military man, half a step to the rear and to his left. And he said, uh, what happened? I said, well, sir, uh, not by way of making excuses, but I said, uh, I had no idea you were going to be giving a medal, a freedom, and I said, and besides that, I wouldn't know where to get one uh, anyhow. I don't know who handles it. The military certainly doesn't handle it. He looked at me with his little squinty eyes, and he said, uh, well, Cross, doggone it, at least you could have handed me an empty box to give him. <laughs> so I just thought, well, one more, one more six o'clock dusting, and uh, we went on from there. We took off and went back uh, over Saigon and headed for Pakistan. That was our next destination. We were going to uh, uh, land there for fuel and see Ayub Khan, uh, who was the president of Pakistan at that time. And as we went across the Indian Ocean, as we approached the coast of India, we uh, could see it out there ahead of us about 50 miles, and then we received orders that we couldn't cross India, that we had to land. And so I told Walt, I said, Walt, you better get in touch with somebody. We had diplomatic clearance, but apparently somebody didn't get the word. I said, Walt, you better get a hold of somebody and uh, try to get us clearance to cross India, because India and Pakistan was not too friendly at that time, and I understand now they're even less friendly. But in any event, Walt got a hold of a fellow named Bromley Smith, who was secretary to the National Security Council in the White House. Bromley apparently got a hold of Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who was the Prime Minister of India, and just about the time we crossed the coastline, Mrs. Gandhi called off the fighter planes that were going to escort us to land, and we went on and landed in uh, uh, Pakistan, visited with Ayub Khan. From there we took off. and. The president still didn't want anybody to know we were going to Rome, and so he told me, now don't you let anybody know, and so I filed a flight plan for Madrid, Spain, figuring that as we got in the vicinity of Rome that we would change our flight plan and uh, whisk into Champino Airport, which was the old civilian airport at Rome, uh, and we did. We did just that. I had already, uh, prior to the time I left Washington, uh, shipped cars and uh, people and helicopters, dismantled of course, uh, on board C-141 aircraft, over to the uh, uh, general area. They were at uh, some little base in India, I've forgotten the name of it. But the weather was so bad that we couldn't uh, get those helicopters put back together. Well anyway, when we landed at Champino, we had no stairs to get off the airplane, I sent uh, Sergeant Joe Chappell, who was my flight engineer, off the plane on a rope, and he commandeered a maintenance stand that was one of those old yellow painted things that they worked on engines with. And we finally got the president off, and we had no helicopters to move him from uh, the plane to see the president of 
Italy and then on to see the Pope at the Vatican. So Marvin Watson and I got off the plane, uh, found out that there was a small rescue unit belonging to our United States Navy there that were using reciprocating engined World War II type helicopters. And so we commandeered uh, two of those helicopters to take the president over to see Sargat and then from there to, to the Vatican to see the Pope. In the meantime, our planes had been uh, reassembled, I should say, put the rotors back on them and whatnot, and uh, the weather cleared sufficiently that we could test fly them, and by the time the president got ready to come back to the plane, we were able to send our own helicopters and pick him up and bring him back to uh, Champino Airport. Uh, we took off from there, headed out over the Atlantic, and just as we passed over the Straits of Gibraltar, headed for uh, the Azores, we didn't have sufficient fuel to make it all the way to Washington, so we had to stop in, Azor, in the Azores where we have a base, or we had a base over there at the time. And just as we passed uh, uh, through the Straits, the president came into the cockpit, and uh, Sergeant Chapel said, here comes the president, everybody clear out. So everybody cleared out of the cockpit, except the left the jump seat open behind me. The president walked up and he said, uh, tapped me on the shoulder and he said, uh, Cross, have you done your Christmas shopping yet? And I said, no, sir. By the way, this is Christmas Eve of 1967, about 3 a.m. in the morning, 2 or 3 a.m. I said, no, sir, I haven't. He said, well, uh, have we got a base where we're going to stop over here? I said, yes, sir, we got Az uh, Lodges Air Force Base in the Azores Islands. He said, well, the president and none of his guests have done any Christmas shopping either. He said, you call up that commander over there and tell him that the president wants him to open up the PX tonight. We're all going to do some Christmas shopping. So I did. I got on the radio phone and called the commanding officer. He was a, a brigadier general. Forgotten his name. And told him that the president wanted the PX to be opened up. And he said, what? I said, well, we want to open the PX uh, so that the president can do his Christmas shopping. He said, okay. So they opened the PX, had no clerks or anything. I guess they gathered together anybody that was warm body and put them down there as clerks. And when we got there, uh, the president and all of his party all of the crew except the engineer who had to stay and see the refueling uh, process. We all jumped on an old school bus and went down to <clears throat> the PX and shopped. And then we took off, of course, and came on back to uh, Washington. <clears throat> Have I got time for one more little story? <clears throat> Let me take a sip of water. should be obvious, but uh, people not thinking about it, you might finish that up by saying uh, uh, that uh, this is probably the first time a president has ever circumnavigated the globe and flown around the world. Or so. Good point. In fact, the matter is, I've, I'm trying to write a book right now, and I believe I've got that very point in the book. <clears throat> I'm ready. Okay. Uh, Actually, when we arrived there at uh, Lodges and uh, saw the military folk that were there, of course, for the arrival, there were a lot of people there, uh, supporters of ground crews and that sort of thing. We always had to have help with our airplane to refuel it and so forth. And in actual fact, I suppose that this is the first time that a president of the United States has ever circumnavigated the globe, the, the world, in less than five days in an airplane and uh, surprised the people at uh, lodges in this particular case. In fact, we surprised a lot of people at a lot of places around the world on that epic journey. Uh, and I venture to say that a president of the United States will never perform such a trip as that, certainly in that length of time, again. Uh, it was truly an epic journey, and uh, yours truly is 
or was certainly honored to have been on the trip and uh, had a hand in making it successful the president. He was very pleased uh, when he got back to Washington. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> he told me, he said, well, now you go home and rest. Enjoy Christmas with your family. And uh, we won't be going anywhere this year. We're going to stay at the White House. That was Christmas Eve, by the way. I got home, went to bed for a few hours. My wife and I got up, uh, went to Marlowe Heights uh, shopping mall and did some Christmas shopping ourselves. And about four o'clock that afternoon, the president called me and said, uh, we need to get the plane ready that we'd be going to the ranch or to Texas tomorrow, the day after Christmas. <laughs> so he surprised me again. I want to tell you one more story. Go ahead. Uh, when he made his announcement that he wasn't going to run for president in the upcoming election, 68, uh, we knew, everybody in the White House knew that there was going to be a major speech that particular night, March the 31st, I believe, of 1968. And uh, I was busy in my office there in the east wing of the White House till about 8 o'clock, but I knew that the speech would start at 9, and so I wound up my work and wanted to rush home so I could watch the speech on television and eat my supper and whatnot. Well, I got home and I had a steak or something, and I was sitting there watching the speech, and uh, as surprised as everyone, I suppose, when he announced that uh, he wouldn't seek the nomination and wouldn't accept the nomination to run for president again. I told my wife, Marie, I said, honey, I better hustle out of here in the morning pretty early because it's very likely that it, he may want to talk to me. Uh, particularly uh, noteworthy events, oftentimes the next day he would always have something to say to me. <clears throat> So I did. I left the house about 6.30, which was a little ahead of the traffic. Got to the White House about 7 o'clock, and sure enough, he called me about 7.30. He said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in the office, Mr. President. He said, come on over here. I want to talk to you. So I said, all right, sir. And I, I came upstairs. I knew he was upstairs in the bedroom. Found him up there in the bed in his pajamas, reading his night reading and reading the papers and so forth. He said to me, he said, well, what'd you think about my talk last night? And I said, well, Mr. President, whatever you want to do is certainly fine with me. I said, uh, I'm with you all the way, whatever you want to do. He said, well, said, uh, what's going to happen to you once uh, I'm no longer in the, pre in the presidency to take care of you? I said, sir, you don't have to worry about me. Thanks to you, you've made me a full colonel in the Air Force, and the Air Force will certainly have something for me to do, or I can retire because I had at that point in time, I believe, about 25 years of service. And he says, oh, no. I said, how would you like to go down and be the commander at Bergstrom Air Force Base? And I uh, have told this story, I suspect, before. And some of my friends, Bob Hardesty, among others, may have heard it. But anyway, he said, uh, how would you like to go down and be commander at Bergstrom Air Force Base? And I said, well, sir, there's nothing I'd like any better than that. As a matter of fact, you don't know this, but my father was the general superintendent of construction when Bergstrom was built in 1942. And as a matter of fact, I worked there as a water boy. I was 17 years old at that time as a water boy in the summer of 1942 before I went back to my home in Alabama to finish my final year in high school and be drafted into the Army Air Corps. He said, uh, well, said, you know, once I am no longer the president, said, I'm not going to have a friend in the world. And he said, uh, maybe if you're down there as a commander of that air base, he said, uh, you'd let me use your hospital and your PX and your commissary. I said, oh, yes, sir, I surely would if, if I were the commander. He said, uh, well, Figure on going down there now because I've talked to General McConnell. McConnell was the chief of staff of the Air Force at that time. And they tell me they're going to make you a general. And I said, well, sir, I certainly have you to thank for that. I doubt seriously that the Air Force uh, would have made me a general without your encouragement. He said, no, no, you deserve it. And said, uh, I want you down there. And said, <clears throat> by the way, when you, when you 
get down there, he said, I want you to take one of these Convair airplanes that we've had refitted with the turbojet engine, turboprop engines on them. He said, uh, you, since you're going to be a general, you'll need your own private plane for surveying your domain. And I said, well, yes, sir. Of course, I knew that I didn't need a private airplane. He said, would you let me use it? Oh, yes, sir. And he said, and you, and you need to send a couple of those uh, Huey helicopters like we've got down there in San Antonio down there because you'll need a couple of those too. You'll have things that you'll want to use them for. And, uh, yes, sir, I will. Obviously, it wasn't for me. I, I was quite aware. And he said, and while you're at it, said, be sure and put those nice uh, soft interiors in it with the colors that Ms. Johnson likes. <laughs> I said, oh, yes, sir, we'll, we'll take care of that. And uh, after giving me a few more instructions about things that he wanted me to do around the White House and, and within the last few days that I was going to be there, uh, I had a list about that long, I suppose, of things. I always tried to take notes to, so I wouldn't forget anything. And he said, uh, well, can you be out of here this week? And I don't recall the date, but it seems to me like that might have been the middle of the week and he wanted me out by Friday. I said, well, no, sir, I can't quite be out by Friday. I suspect that uh, I'll have a little trouble selling my home over close to Andrews. And I said, I've got uh, three children in school over there. They won't be out till around the 1st of June. He said, well, figure on, on leaving about the 1st of June. And I said, all right, sir. And that was the end of the conversation. And just as I started to walk out the door, he said, oh, by the way, said General McConnell tells me that uh, if you're going to be in command of that air base down there, they've got some kind of fighter planes or something, and said, you need to go down there and train in those fighter planes and go to Vietnam and fly some combat before you come back because uh, all your people are going to have been combat veterans. And I said, well, yes, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. I've been wanting to go. As a matter of fact, I had tried, I didn't remind him of this, but I had tried uh, earlier to get him to let me go over there, if nothing more than on a visit, to Quezon, where the Marines were under siege for a long time, about the time of the Tet Offensive. And just to tell those poor fellows that their president was behind them 100% and that uh, he was worried about them and that me being a direct representative as his uh, military aide uh, would perhaps tell them something about how much he cared, but he wouldn't let me go. And so I was tickled to death that I was finally going to get to go to, to Vietnam and, and fly some combat. Uh, actually, I did. I went down and trained in the RF-4s. They were photo reconnaissance jets rather than fighters. Uh, it took me about two months or so to get checked out in those, and then I went to Vietnam, and I flew 17 combat missions over there, and uh, uh, was thrilled to have the opportunity to do it. But I got over there, and I was there for maybe three months or something on that order, and the word came that uh, General Brown, who was the commander, wanted to see me. He said that uh, he had been called to in the middle of the night by the president and to get me the hell out of there that uh, they wanted me home. So I came home just before Christmas of 1968 and took over as the wing commander at Bergstrom Air Force Base uh, in uh, February, 1st of February 1969. Uh, that was pretty much the years of my association with the president. I uh, considered it a huge honor privilege to have been there, uh, something I shall never forget. After he became the former president, the ex-president, uh, I stayed real close to him and every time he uh, wanted something, uh, whatever it was, I jumped, dropped whatever else I was doing to abide his wishes. And the saddest day of my life, I guess, was when he died and Ms. Johnson called me. I, by the way, had uh, maintained as the military aide and when I left Washington, he made sure that I carried with me uh, the funeral plan for his passing. Uh, 
As a military aide, I had plans for all of the ex-presidents that were still living and for him as well. In his case, he wanted me to take the funeral plan home with me or to Texas with me. And over the months uh, and years that he was the ex-president and I was both uh, a civilian or as well as civilian, I should say, uh, he would admonish me from time to time to keep that funeral plan handy. You know, Cross, I'm going to pass on one of these days. And we'd be riding around his ranch in, in a Lincoln convertible or whatever. Oftentimes when he'd invite me out there to talk about something, we'd always stop at the cemetery and he'd remind me, now Cross, I expect you to bury me right here next to his mother and his father. Hey, keep that funeral plan handy and you check it out from time to time with Ms. Johnson. She needs to stay current on it. I said, you call Ms. Johnson. Well, I'd call Ms. Johnson. We'd talk about it. But she didn't choose to ever let's pull it out and review it until the day that he died. And I got a call from her that I should come with that. And uh, that was the end of my association with him, although we're still very close to the family, and, and thank God for that. Thank you. Splendid.